Hello and welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, the old sensation. Labor still blaming Mark Latham for their poor showing in the election campaign. Should political parties take cash from the tobacco industry? And the little big bang. Scientists on the French Swiss border recreate the collision that led to what's thought was to be the creation of the universe. Our panel tonight, Tori Maguire, editor of The Punch. Peter Lewis from Essential Media Communications. And in Canberra, economics correspondent with The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, Peter Martin. Well, Treasurer Wayne Swan delivered his budget update today and the federal government is expecting a bigger budget deficit this financial year at $41.5 billion, almost $1 billion more than the July forecast. Tax revenue is down by about $10 billion over the next four years due to the rising dollar. But the government says it's still on track to return a surplus in the 2012-13 financial year. The update that I'm releasing today shows that Australia remains ahead of the pack with strong growth and a return to surplus in three years. These numbers demonstrate the fastest, most positive turnaround in the government finances in 40 years. There's not a major advanced economy in the world that wouldn't prefer our economic and budget position. But Opposition Treasury spokesman Joe Hockey says the latest figures are a recipe for higher interest rates. The first thing is the budget is clearly deteriorating as the economy gets better. To have a reduction in unemployment down to 4.5% and yet the budget deficit's getting worse and the debt's getting bigger illustrates the fact that this is a government that doesn't know what it's doing. Secondly, the debt is now growing out to 90, nearly $95 billion. So the debt's getting worse when the economy is meant to be getting better. Thirdly, the surplus in 2012-13 is a marvel of accounting trickery. Peter Martin, it was expected that tax revenue would be down due to the changes in the value of the dollar, but it was also expected there would be significant spending cuts. What, what happened to them? I think they created uh, the false expectations, Steve, uh, for their own reasons. There are spending, uh, not so much spending cuts, they're the sort of things that you'd hardly notice, um, uh, shall we say, moving of expenditure. So spending on Victorian railways moves uh, conveniently out of the, the four-year forward estimates period uh, where it needs to be included in the figures, just moves one year. There are a lot, lot of little things like that you'd scarcely notice, but uh, I think they talked up the problem. They said we're going to have $10 billion cut to government spending, uh, government revenue, you know, because of the higher dollar. Well, it turns out they also have, uh, as anyone would know who's affected by the higher dollar, uh, <laughs> it's easier to buy things. So they've got a $6 billion cut to government spending. You know, they can go on Amazon and buy aircraft carriers and IT and so on. So uh, it, it, basically uh, you're looking at uh, a net $4 billion hit to revenue. That's over four years. That's about $1 billion a year, which is uh, fairly manageable, given that the Australian economy uh, was even, uh, Joe Hockey conceded, what with unemployment now forecast to come down to 4.5%, given that the economy is going gangbusters. So given that unemployment is falling and that growth is, is likely to increase, why did they not take that as an opportunity to pay off more of the debt faster? I think the Treasury would have liked them to. It's worthwhile actually looking at the Treasury document and, uh, you know, th th there are limits on what bureaucrats can say, uh, but they can say a lot within those limits and they, they are worried by the low unemployment. Uh, they made the point of saying that uh, four and a half to five percent is their estimate of full employment, or they call it non-accelerating inflation employment, uh, and uh, that uh, this low unemployment will put pressure on uh, inflation and so on, which will have to be dealt with either by higher interest rates. Uh, the dollar will help, by the way, but it'll uh, have to be dealt with, uh, aside from that, by higher interest rates or by spending cuts. And they, they've, uh, they've uh, made that point. But uh, Wayne Swan is having none of it. He says, well, look, uh, and he's quite right. <laughs> he said, all right, the dollar's, what, uh, 101 US at the moment. Uh, it might be high, it might be lower tomorrow. Uh, and in four years' time, it's scarcely worth forecasting. So, uh, uh, and we probably will get big spending cuts, but we didn't get them today. Peter Lewis, so the Coalition has brought out the line they used to use on uh, Kim Beasley, lack of ticker. They're saying there's no courage in this Labor government to actually have some decent spending cuts. Yeah, look, and I think there's a couple of things going on here. Firstly, I think they are trying to goad Labor into running some 
issues on it, the economy that are going to be really hard to sustain. I know the coalition went to the last election with promises of big job cuts in the public sector. I believe there's still a debate going on within levels of government about whether they do take some job cuts to the next budget. But the second thing, and I think this is the elephant in the room, that neither side of politics is really addressing the massive amounts of middle class welfare that are still going out of Canberra in direct payments. This was the model of shareholder democracy that the Howard government brought in. Labor has not put their hands on that. I don't think that's the that's lack of tick of the coalition talking that, about. Uh, Chris Richardson from Access brought that up today about whether you get rid of middle class welfare and also industry welfare. Yeah. He said they were two areas that really needed to be targeted. Uh, Tori, one point that um, I wanted to bring up with you was that there is a little bit of a savings measure here, $67 million for delaying cash for clunkers, but surely this was the golden opportunity to get rid of cash for clunkers. It would have been perfect. And look, they haven't been afraid to scrap um, dodgy policies up to now, but maybe um, they took the view that it would have looked like they were just you know, throwing everything out and they're trying to cling on to at least some of their election promises. This is a particularly stupid one, though. I think it would have been great if they could have got rid of it now and it would have been the perfect excuse. Peter Martin, um, Joe Hockey says the government has delivered a recipe for higher interest rates. Is he right to say that? I guess he is. Uh, interest rates will be higher. The uh, Treasury said that uh, it's uh, factored in the market forecasts and they're forecasting uh, another one or another two hikes. Uh, the Reserve Bank said it's factoring into its forecast that. Even with that, it expects inflation to reach 3%, which is the sort of top of the uh, the target band uh, by mid-2012. Uh, so, yes, there'll probably be further hikes. Uh, and but can I you pin them on well um, Wayne those... Swan? Well, well, we may well get those spending cuts. Uh, it's just, as Wayne Swan said, this is not the opportunity to do it. The opportunity is in the May budget. And that'll be very tempting, because if they do have a lot of spending cuts in the May budget, then they might be able to, heaven forbid, have the surplus one year earlier. It's possible, uh, particularly if uh, you know mining revenue keeps up. Or uh, they might be able to have a much bigger surplus. So uh, that will happen, but they, they decided today's not the time. We'll wait and see what happens there. Leaks and Latham, they were the two main factors in Labor nearly losing the last election. That's according to the ALP's National Secretary. Today, Carl Batard dr delivered his address to the National Press Club, analysing Labor's performance at the federal election. People will not vote for a party which is not united. And the fact that we were still in the race despite all of the leaks and all the sense of disunity on our side is a real indication of how much people preferred Prime Minister Gillard over Tony Abbott. And it's a real indication of how unelectable Tony Abbott really was. The fact that they changed strategy significantly three times in the election campaign, as did we, shows you the impacts of the leaks and Latham on that election campaign. P. Lewis, what do you make of that analysis by Carl Bittahar? Look, I've got a high regard for Carl, but I thought today's analysis was pretty bizarre. Beyond blaming, which everyone seems to have passed the election, blaming the leaks and Latham, there was this other weird argument that Carl led off, or, off with, which was, went like this. We could not convince people we were the underdog, therefore we couldn't make them scared of voting for Tony Abbott, therefore we almost got defeated. Now... What this all speaks to is it was all political tactics rather than strategy. And let's be honest, the reason that Labor struggled was it couldn't build a story. It could not talk about what it had achieved because it had knifed its leader and it couldn't talk about what it was going to do moving forward because it had junked action on climate change. So it was snookered. Now, I actually thought there was a story Carl could have said today which was fairly heroic. They sandbagged a lot of seats they should have lost. They should have lost government, but it was not because of Lex he, and Latham. He, he kind of said that, Tori, um, but it seems like there's still Labor's still underestimating Tony Abbott. That he's saying there that Tony Abbott's unelectable. And he's done that on the day that News Poll comes out and has the coalition mm. at their highest two party preferred in years. I mean, he, I think he's got his head, well, I think he's probably trying to do some of his own skin Man, saving. Maybe some of that sandbagging Peter Lewis referred mm. to has gone around Carl's head. And the other thing is that that sandbagging was also um, probably the result of a level of disorganisation in the Liberal Party. Mm. I mean, there were seat, plenty of seats in New South Wales that really the Liberals probably would have won they if they'd got won. their act yeah. together well, earlier didn't have a and, candidate, and pre-selected um, in properly instead of focusing on, you know, membership of young Liberal branches. <laughs> but um, I, yeah. the other thing I thought was interesting is that people are now talking about the leaks without talking about Kevin Rudd as if they're two separate things. And now yeah. it's almost as if Kevin Rudd's being a little bit rehabilitated now that 
you know, the US Secretary of State is crediting him with their entire, <laughs> changing the yeah. entire US but, foreign but, policy. But again, it speaks to this difficulty. You just can't bag your foreign minister for yeah, stuffing up exactly. the election so it's all done in code. So you could bag him when he was a backbencher, but you can't bag well, him now. Paul Howes is still doing it. Peter Martin, <laughs> what did you make of uh, that Carl Batar's yeah. analysis today? I think he was right about the, uh, the good government that has lost its way. Remember that? How can you vote for a good government that has lost its way? I suppose you can, but it's not exactly a selling proposition. And yet that was what Gillard began saying, and uh, that's what we had all through the election. So it was, if you like, uh, maybe the people got it right. But it was a case of uh, choosing between uh, unenviable uh, alternatives uh, for many of them. And the, the coalition uh, treasury team... Um, I don't think was that good. Uh, Andrew Robb was their details person and, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, Abbott would uh, defer economic questions to hockey, who would defer them to Robb. The costings were done by a Perth accountancy firm of questionable experience in that field. So it really was a, an awful choice that the voters had. And, of course, we, we, we voted informal. So uh, mm. I guess he's right about that, yeah. Peter Lewis, Carl Batar said he was optimistic that Labor could win the next election. And one of the reasons he cited at that press, um, pr uh, press club address today was that he felt like Tony Abbott was not articulating what the Liberals stand for. He's articulating what the Liberals stand against. Look, politics in the 21st century is really about building a narrative and connecting with the people. And I think that's where Labor is still struggling. I think Tony Abbott has been a really effective opposition. I say this from someone on the left of politics who warned from the beginning that Abbott would be formidable. Remember, Abbott convinced mm. Australians to vote against the Republic, even mm. though the majority of people wanted it. Abbott is formidable and people that dismiss him are going to get themselves in a whole lot of difficulty. Likewise, Joe Hockey. It's easy to make fun of Joe Hockey and say that he blathers on and he's a big bear of a man, but he nailed it on the banks over the last couple of weeks. He got there first. His only problem on the banks, though, was Tony Abbott. I mean, if he'd gotten well, once they realised he was on the right track, they let him have his air and now he's the hero of the working yeah. people. It is bizarre at the moment. Well, anyone trying to dig Labor out of its current hole could start by turning their attention to the kitchen table. That's what Peter Lewis says in an article he's written for The Drum online today. Peter's been analysing the figures in this week's Essential Report and says Labor is involved in a messy food fight. Pete, what's that mean? Look... Kitchen table politics is where Labor is meant to run the, um, win the public debate. So the, the sort of gravity of politics is that the right of centre parties are meant to be seen as better managers of the, econo the, the economy in abstract terms, keeping um, unemployment.